The source of the dew makes for an unforgettable walking destination. As you set foot on the 100-meter forest path, you'll be greeted by a serene atmosphere filled with breathtaking landscapes and trees that are sure to capture your attention. As you progress further, the sound of rushing water grows louder and more intense, heightening your senses and fueling your curiosity about what lies ahead. Soon enough, the tantalizing sound of the water will lead you straight to the entrance of the source. This is John Manley's story and the source of the Do cave diving disaster of 2008. Bonjour and welcome to the little Siberia of France. Nestled in the Jura Mountains, Moth is notorious for being the coldest town in France, with temperatures plummeting to minus 39 degrees in winter and soaring to a scorching plus 36 degrees in summer. Thus, it's earned itself the nickname Little Siberia due to its extreme climate. The Risu mountain range, a heavily forest area in the Jura region, runs in a southwest northeast direction and marks the national border between Switzerland and France. Despite the frigid temperatures, the source of the Dew, located just two kilometers from Muth, is a popular natural attraction in the area. The source de Dew, which sits at the foot of Mount Rissou and Le Gros Cré, is a frequently explored cave system. It is situated at an altitude of 935 meters above sea level and serves as the source of the Dew River. Due to the karst spring's quick response to rainfall or snowmelt, the current discharge can be easily monitored online. However, if the water level exceeds 0.6 meters cubed, diving is not permitted. A permit is required for diving the spring, which can be applied for at the Marie de Moth. The water remains at a constant temperature of 6 degrees throughout the year, retaining its pristine clarity regardless of the weather conditions. The cave keeps its mystery since divers have yet to determine the origin of the waters that weave their way through the rocks in a complex network. Truly, a secret kept by nature. The source of Dedeu has been a pursuit for daring cave divers for decades. In 1969, the source was explored for the first time by the two Swiss cave divers, J.C. Fracon and P. Petroquin, up to the S2 section of the cave. Then, in 1987, Italian diver S.T. Lecco pushed the boundaries, reaching a depth of 50 meters, or 164 feet, in the S3 section. But it wasn't until 1989 that the late and legendary Swiss cave diver Jean-Jacques Bollens made the groundbreaking discovery. Reaching the previous end of the S3 section after 322 meters or 1,056 feet on his last dive, but could not go any further as there was a fall that he could not pass. The fact that it took so many years to get to this point of the cave speaks volumes for the incredible achievement that Jean-Jacques Bollons achieved back then with an open system and air as the main breathing gas. Fast forward to November the 18th, 2007, when a new chapter in the cave's history was written. John Volenthen, a seasoned diver, fearlessly plunged into the depths, braving the obstacles and laying 145 meters or 476 feet of line, successfully passing through the formidable fall that had stopped Bollons years before. A year later, on September the 10th, 2008, Andre Glor and Pedro Bellardi passed the fall and laid a second marked line setting a new terminus at a total distance of 472 meters or 1,549 feet from the entrance. In the following dives, they continuously extended the terminus until they reached the distance of a jaw-dropping 1,050 meters or 3,445 feet. Merely 18 days after, on September the 28th, 2008, with the ambition to edge his name in the record books of this cave, John Manley set out to explore the Source de Dew, accompanied by two of his trusted friends who were certified divers. Little did John know that fate had a somber outcome in store for him. Unfortunately for John, his name would forever be associated with this cave, but in the most heart-wrenching of manners. The cave that he sought to conquer would forever be associated with his tragedy, rather than triumph.
Born in 1976, John's insatiable thirst for learning led him to excel academically at King's Manor School, where he absorbed knowledge at a prodigious rate. But John's appetite for excitement didn't stop there. In his youth, he found solace in the Scouts, relishing the open-air life and the company of his peers. As he stepped into adulthood, John worked for various local companies before finding his true calling at Ricardo Engineering in Shoreham, England. This global engineering consultancy, tasked with solving complex issues for a safe and sustainable world, was the perfect fit for John's sharp mind and exceptional skills. As stated prior, John absorbed and retained knowledge at a prodigious rate and very quickly became a valuable employee capable of working away from base on specialist projects around the world. Aside from work, John had a love for motorcycling and scuba diving that took him on thrilling adventures. He was trained locally before eventually joining Brighton's British Sub Aqua Club, BSAC, and quickly became a reliable member, even rebuilding parts of the dive boat engine and the club compressor. Ever restless, John's thirst for exploration was unquenchable as he became a regular diver, pushing his fellow club members to discover new wreck sites and adopt safer diving practices by encouraging them towards using a different dive gas to prolong and make their diving safer. He enjoyed several diving holidays with many friends, diving the Normandy shipwrecks and those around the Isles of Scilly. But that wasn't enough for John. His passion for diving led him to acquire a rebreather and undergo specialised training, which took him to more adventurous diving groups and much deeper wrecks. After acquiring his rebreather, plus the training to accommodate it, he eventually ventured into cave diving in the UK and France, but he always made sure to return to dive with his friends in the sea on a regular basis, while keeping them all excited with captivating tales of his underground exploits and explorations. Whilst he lived his life adventurously, he was always careful, entirely competent, looked after his equipment well, and understood exactly how it worked. However, an unexpected twist of fate was about to change everything. On September the 28th, 2008, John Manley, John Volanthin, and Charles Reed Henry reached the source of doom. Their plan was for each of them to independently dive and explore the cave system without assistance from others, which is known as autonomous diving. It's worth noting that John Manley was wearing a very large rebreather when he started exploring the cave. This, in turn, makes further exploration of the cave extremely challenging. Many narrow passages and very shallow passages pose a great risk of damage to equipment. In case of an emergency, they also hinder a quick return. John Volanthin and Charles Reed Henry had warned him the night before that the rebreather would be too big to pass through some of the narrower parts of the cave system, but John didn't heed their warnings. It's also important to mention that John broke his back during a motorcycle accident in 1998 and has since suffered the long-term injuries from it. These details become relevant later on in the story. The entrance of the cave is quite narrow, only about 3.5 meters deep or 11 feet, and he moved cautiously, taking care not to get stuck in the narrow passage. After about 13 meters or 43 feet, John reached the upper ledge of the shaft leading into the depth, marked as S3. As John began his descent into S3, the water became darker and colder and he relied heavily on his flashlight at this point to guide him through the rest of the cave. John continued his exploration of the phreatic cave passage, carefully making his way down the almost vertical shaft. He knew that he had to be extremely cautious, as the slightest mistake could have dire consequences. The descent was becoming steeper, and the water pressure increased. As he approached the bottom of the shaft at 322 meters, or 1,056 feet, the passage widened into a larger obstruction hall covered with a lot of blocky material at the bottom. To the right of the shaft floor was a narrow crevice that led to the uphill cave passage. John noticed that there was particularly a large amount of sediment there, 
which resulted in very strong turbidity. As he moved through the narrow crevice, John remained focused and alert. He knew that he was in a dangerous environment and he had to be prepared for anything. But he also knew that the beauty of this underwater world was worth the risks he was taking. As he swam through the hall, he noticed the passage on the left-hand side that led to the further running passage on the valley side. This small and difficult to pass window is located at 457 meters or 1,500 feet from the entrance. In 2002, for safety reasons, cave divers slightly enlarged the passage with a hammer and chisel. With his training and experience, John carefully maneuvered through the passage, keeping a close eye on his depth gauge and his air supply. The passage started directly under the known shaft bottom of the S3 section. However, the collapse of the hall buried the first 30 meters or 98 feet. As he emerged on the other side of the passage, he felt a sense of relief and accomplishment. He had successfully navigated through one of the more difficult passages of the cave and was now moving towards the next section. After about 555 meters or 1,821 feet, John reached the first major fold zone. John continued through the now steeply sloping passage, taking note of several accumulations of gravel banks along the way. These obstacles prevented him from diving any further but he was content with the progress he had made. And as he approached the end of his air supply, John knew that it was time to turn back. He had reached the limit of his dive based on the rule of thirds, a safety measure that ensured he would have enough air to safely return to the surface. As he prepared to swim back, John reflected on the beauty and mystery of the underwater cave system he had been exploring. He was grateful for the opportunity to witness such an incredible natural wonder and he knew that he would carry the memory of this dive with him for the rest of his life. John began to make his way back through the cave, retracing his steps and taking care to navigate the obstacles he had encountered on the way in. John found himself at the end of the S2 section of the cave, facing a series of tight obstructions caused by large boulders. Navigating through this section would require careful attention and skillful maneuvering to avoid getting stuck or dislodging any rocks. As previously mentioned, John's rebreather was quite large and it caused him some difficulty navigating through this particular section of the cave on his way in. To avoid a repeat of this, John made the ill-fated decision to remove his rebreather and managed to squeeze through the gap breathing from another bottle. After struggling to put his rebreather back on, John realized that he wouldn't be able to do so due to the tight passages of the cave and his back injury which he suffered in 1998. He was left with no other option but to attempt to resurface while holding the bottle under his arm. In attempting to resurface while holding the bottle under his arm, John found himself in a dire situation. He made a very uncontrolled and rapid ascent while the bottle suddenly became loose from the rubber hose attached to his mouthpiece, leaving him without an air supply. He was still quite a distance from the cave entrance, therefore he frantically tried to retrieve the bottle to be able to breathe again. Despite his best efforts, John was unable to retrieve the lost bottle as it had vanished into the abyss and, as a result, he began losing consciousness due to a severe lack of oxygen. John Volanthen and Charles Reed Henry, having returned to the entrance of the cave, began to worry about John's whereabouts and feared the worst. They could not wait any longer as four hours had passed since commencing the dive. They called for emergency services and then decided to re-enter the cave to search for him. Unfortunately, their worst fears were confirmed when they discovered John's lifeless body trapped under a ledge 26 meters or 85 feet down the main shaft of the cave. They quickly brought John's body to the surface where firefighters attempted artificial resuscitation. But unfortunately, it was too late. John had already drowned and passed away at the age of 32. This tragic story serves as a reminder of the innate dangers of cave diving, even for experienced divers like John. While he attempted to adapt to the situation and find a solution, it was not enough to save his life. John's story highlights the importance of proper training 
equipment, and preparedness when engaging in such activities. While John may have made a mistake, his passion for exploration and adventure should not be forgotten. May he rest in peace. Join us on Gripping Horror as we delve into the infamous diving spot called the Pool of Death, renowned for claiming the lives of 21 divers. The frigid water temperature and the extreme depth pose significant challenges for divers, leading to a substantial number of drowning incidents and even cases of heart attacks. The number of fatalities at the quarry could have been much higher, considering the numerous close calls and fortunate escapes that have occurred. Dorothy Quarry itself is not fundamentally dangerous. The problem arises from the lack of regulation, which leads divers to attempt things beyond their capabilities. Over the years, numerous harrowing accounts have surfaced of divers pushing their limits to the point of exhaustion. Subsequently, these divers have become incapable of recovering and ascending to the surface. Furthermore, the fact that some individuals are diving as deep as 100 meters on air, despite the accepted limit being 50 meters, says a lot about the lack of awareness and responsibility among some of these divers. These are the harrowing accounts of Paula Blakemore, Jason Dean, and John Edward, and the tragedies that befell them at Dorothy Quarry. Dorothy Quarry has a rich history dating back to the early 1820s when it was first leased by William Turner and named Clodfer Turner. Later, the quarry was renamed Dorothy by Turner's son in 1829, who was the manager at the time. The quarry was the largest in the area and employed up to 200 men, producing 5,000 to 6,000 tons of slate annually. However, profits began to decline in the 1840s leading to the quarry sale in 1848. A group of quarrymen purchased Dorothy and renewed the lease in 1851. Production peaked in 1872, with 17,442 tons produced, and the most profitable year was 1875, generating £14,738, or equivalent to £1.5 million today. By the 1930s, over 350 men were employed at the quarry. However, production dropped after the start of World War II, and the quarry eventually closed in 1970. As stated previously, despite the official ban on diving in the Dorothy Quarry and the lack of provided facilities, the site has become a popular destination for diving since quarrying ended in 1970. However, the unregulated nature of the site and its depth have led some divers to overestimate their abilities. As a result, in the decade between 1994 and 2004, 21 divers lost their lives in the quarry. Located in the Nantel Valley region of North Wales, the Dorothy Quarry is an abandoned slate quarry that spans a vast area near the village of Talisan and contains three flooded deep lakes with a maximum depth of 106 meters, or 348 feet, the Dorothy Quarry is not only expansive, but also extremely deep. Not to mention there are several deep sections within it, including sections with floors at 25 meters, or 82 feet, 40 meters, or 131 feet, and even deeper. The quarry boasts many remnants of its past, such as old huts, cranes, cables, and tunnel sections. In addition, there is a car stack located on the west side of the quarry, not shown on the maps, where numerous cars have been discarded and piled on top of one another over time. The deeper you venture into the quarry, the older the cars become. Some of the tunnels in the quarry are accessible and lead through outcrops and ridges. The shallowest section near the car park is useful as a deco loop to swim around in while finishing a dive. During the summer months, the water in Dorothy Quarry is affected by severe algae blooms near the surface. However, the water clears up beyond approximately 15 meters or 49 feet. Due to this phenomenon, Dorothy remains dark throughout the year, and other than on the surface, 
the water in the quarry is excruciatingly cold, especially in the winter. Paula Blakemore had always been passionate about diving. She loved the feeling of weightlessness, the quietness of the underwater world, and the freedom that came with exploring it. So, when her friend Jeff Keep suggested they start a diving club together in 2001, she jumped at the opportunity. The two of them founded New Frontier Diving Limited, which was based at Paula's home on Long Down Road in Concordon, England. They offered diving courses and training to students from all over Greater Manchester, and Paula was the lead instructor. She loved teaching others how to dive and sharing her passion with them. One of her many students stated, she conducted and instructed the course in a professional yet friendly manner. Paula made the course interesting, fun, and as always, drilled in the safety aspects. Another former pupil added, I was immediately impressed by her genuine warmth and enthusiasm for diving. Whether it be teaching courses or doing some serious diving for fun, I expected to find the skills tough, but Paula was very flexible in her approach and we all managed to master the skills required. Paula loved teaching, but her true passion was deep wreck diving, which only grew after completing her rebreather course. Paula Blakemore, now age 43, had always been an adventurer at heart. She loved the feeling of exploring new places, whether on land or underwater. Her love for adventure only grew after meeting her husband, Mike Blakemore, who was also a diver, was a perfect match for Paula. They had been married for 19 years, and their love for adventure only brought them closer together. Paula especially loved the thrill of exploring sunken ships and discovering the secrets they held. Every weekend of the year, Paula would dive with her husband, her close friend Jeff Keep, or other team members. They spent hours underwater, searching for new wrecks to explore and studying the marine life that surrounded them. One day, Paula heard about a quarry in Wales called Dorothy that was rumoured to hold the wreckage of old huts and quarry workings remaining such as cranes, cables and tunnel sections and she knew she had to explore it. This quarry had pulled divers in with its mystery for decades and Paula was no exception. Unfortunately for Paula, her excitement was short-lived. As seen, Dorothy Quarry was very unforgiving to divers and Paula was about to discover this for herself. Paula and her dive buddy Graham Owen arrived at Dorothy Quarry on March the 15th, 2007, eager to explore its depths. Paula was not only satisfying her own desire for adventure, but also practicing for an upcoming charity dive for guide dogs for the blind. Meanwhile, her husband Mike was completing a dive in the same quarry that day as she arrived. The water was cold and dark, but she was determined as she loved nothing more than diving. As Paula and Graham descended into the water, they were filled with excitement and anticipation. They had heard about the quarry's reputation for being a challenging and dangerous dive site, but they were confident in their abilities and eager to explore. The quarry's murky waters made it difficult to see and the jagged rocks and submerged debris made navigation treacherous. What happens next can be described as a series of unfortunate events. As Graham and Paula descended following a line from a marker boy, both of them were a bit nasally, and after about 6 metres or 20 feet, Graham signalled to abort the dive due to difficulty clearing his ears. It was then they noticed that there was a problem with Paula's rebreather. A valve diaphragm had ruptured. Paula had just been above Graham, but then she vanished, and Graham saw the marker boy sinking past him at a rapid rate. Graham quickly realized that Paula was in trouble and started following the trail of bubbles she left behind as she descended deeper and deeper. He eventually found her clinging to a ridge as she reached 40 meters or 131 feet below the surface. Paula clinged for dear life in a desperate attempt to stop her descent. Graham saw the rope of the marker boy tangled around her left leg that was the result of her rapid descent. Graham tried to pull the rope off her foot, but it was stuck and he could not move it. Paula was breathing using Graham's equipment as her 40 valve stopped her rebreather from functioning, 
but she was getting tired as she continued to fight to get free. The situation only grew more dire. Graham began to become tangled in the rope himself as he tried to save her. Thankfully, Graham was able to free his legs, but as a result of his vicious movements, Graham was disorientated for a time after. When he came back to his senses, he realized Paula had disappeared again and Graham couldn't find any bubbles. Despite his best efforts, Graham had to surface without Paula. He was devastated, knowing that she was still down there. Now back on the surface, Graham sounded the alarm and began contacting emergency services. As the search began, Graham was airlifted to hospital in Bangor as he needed treatment due to the speed he had resurfaced after trying to save her, which resulted in the bends. Paula's husband, Mike, was finishing a dive and had clambered out of the water when the alarm was raised. He helplessly stood by with their three daughters, having taken the heartbreaking decision to tell other divers on site not to risk their lives by trying to rescue his wife because he knew she had sunk too deep. After losing contact, Paula would have lasted only a few seconds. The North Wales police were notified and they launched a search for Paula. Police divers were called in to search the quarry, hoping to find any clues that could lead them to her. Days passed and the search continued. The divers endlessly searched the quarry from end to end, but they were unable to find any sign of Paula. To make matters worse, efforts to recover her body were hampered by the depth of the water in the quarry and debris below the surface, but they refused to give up. Finally, after days of searching, the police divers decided to bring in an underwater robot to help them search the quarry more thoroughly. The robot was state-of-the-art, equipped with the latest sensors and cameras. It was able to search Dorothy in places that the divers couldn't reach, and it gave them a new hope in their search for Paula. Thankfully, three days after the search began, the rescue team discovered a tunnel located 300 feet beneath the surface and found Paula trapped inside. The tunnel was narrow and dangerous, with sharp rocks and poor visibility making it treacherous for even the most experienced divers. It was a grueling and exhausting journey, but finally they emerged from the water and her body was gently laid in a body bag on site. Those who knew Paula would always remember her as a brave and passionate diver who had lived life to the fullest, even in the face of danger. Her husband went on to say, I'm numb. She was such a good diver and I just can't believe this has happened to her. It's a tragic reality that Dorothy's waters have claimed many lives over the years and Paula's tragic fate serves as yet another grim reminder of the dangers of being trapped beneath its water's surface. Gates have been locked and boulders and machinery placed in the way. But despite this, many divers still feel compelled to test their limits and explore the depths of this mysterious and deadly place. The search for answers and the allure of the unknown continue to draw people in, even as the risks remain ever present. As the diving community continues to grapple with the dangers of Dorothy, we can only hope that measures will be taken to ensure the safety of those who choose to explore its depths. But for now, the war between divers and Dorothy rages on, and the outcome remains uncertain. Jason Dean, aged 31, was a civil engineer in Liverpool, England, who had always been passionate about his work. He loved the challenge of designing and building structures that would stand the test of time and he was dedicated to ensuring that every project he worked on was a success. Everyone who knew Jason admired him for his clear-headedness, his ability to take on any challenge, and his infectious energy. He was always the life of the party, and he had a way of making everyone feel at ease in his presence. Despite his love for his job, Jason was also a free spirit who loved to explore the world around him. He had always been one to push himself to new heights, both professionally and personally. Jason's taste for adventure started in the Scouts and became a passion that took him around the world. He learned to dive in Malawi, West Africa, and was a keen mountain climber. And in 1998, he decided to take on one of his biggest challenges yet, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money for the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Appeal. It was no small feat, 
but Jason was determined to see it through. He spent months preparing for the climb, training his body and mind to withstand the grueling conditions he would face on the mountain. After days of climbing and struggling, he reached the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. It was a moment of triumph, not just for Jason, but for everyone who had supported him and the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Appeal. And it was just one of many adventures that Jason would take on over the years. In 2002, he climbed the Palador Peak in the Himalayas, another feat that tested his strength and determination. But no matter where his adventures took him, Jason remained a free spirit, always pushing himself to new heights and inspiring others to do the same. Next of his bucket list was diving the Dorothy Quarry, but not even Jason could have been prepared for the challenges he would face. Despite his experience as an adventurer, diving in the Dorothy Quarry proved to be one of the most difficult and dangerous undertakings of his life. Jason arrived at Dorothy Quarry on the 21st of March 2004. Jason was one of a group of five divers from Wirral who planned to dive about 30 to 35 meters or about 115 feet. The group had originally intended to dive off the Welsh coast of Anglesey but were forced to cancel because of the bad weather. Once at the quarry, they split into two groups, Jason going diving with a close friend, Matthew McNeil, while three others went diving in another part of the quarry. They all intended to dive no more than 30 minutes to minimize the possibility of any risks. As they descended into the murky waters of the Dorothy Quarry, Jason and Matthew kept in close communication, checking on each other's gear and making sure they were safe. But as they reached a halfway depth of their intended dive, something went wrong with his equipment. Matthew and Jason had been swimming towards an area of the quarry at a depth of around 50 feet, when Jason signaled that he wanted to surface. Matthew was immediately concerned, knowing that something must either be wrong with Jason or his equipment. Wanting to ensure the life of his friend, the pair decided to turn back. During their ascent, Matthew realized they were ascending too quickly, signaling to Jason to slow down. At this point, Jason did not appear to be panicking, but in the murky waters of the quarry, it was difficult to communicate effectively, and it's unclear whether Jason had understood the signal. They managed and were now approaching their stop. During the decompression stop, Jason had difficulties maintaining buoyancy. Then, suddenly, in the blink of an eye, similar to Paula's case, Jason began sinking rapidly without warning, and Matthew had no time to react or figure out the cause. Jason was frantically trying to sort things out as he was all over the place. He desperately tried, but failed to fit a spare regulator. Jason was chucking air like a jacuzzi. He was not normally a panicker. Instead of getting better, things got worse. Matthew tried to put air in Jason's dive jacket to help him ascend, but he kept knocking it. Jason was breathing very, very fast. The panic in his eyes was awful. It was out of character. Matthew inflated his own jacket, but it separated both of them quite rapidly. Matthew was trying to get Jason sorted, but couldn't do that because Jason kept panicking. Then Jason let go of him, and he let go of Jason. Matthew descended quickly to try and catch up with Jason, but it was already too late. Jason was sinking faster than he could swim, and at this point there was no way of reaching him without endangering his own life. Matthew was starting to get the bends. Defeated, he returned to the surface to initiate rescue operations. The other members of the diving group had heard his distress signals and frantically rushed back to the surface. Similar to Paula's story, North Wales police divers arrived on the scene promptly and set up their high-tech robots to scour the depths of Dorothy. Thankfully, due to the North Wales Police robot mini-submarine, they were able to locate Jason's body that same day at 4pm, floating on a ledge at a depth of about 40 metres, or 131 feet, with his regulator out of his mouth. A police spokesman confirmed his family had been informed, and a post-mortem examination was due to be carried out at his Betty Gwynedd that same day. Jason's death had been the seventh death in the quarry over the year, and locals were calling for stricter controls over Dorothy. 
his death was revealed to be caused by drowning due to equipment failure. The reason why Jason did not remove his weight belt has always been a mystery to other divers. It is widely believed that this simple precaution could have potentially saved his life by stopping his rapid descent. Matthew couldn't shake the feeling that he could have done more and felt a deep sense of survivor's guilt. But despite his pain, Matthew found solace in the memories of his friend and in the knowledge that Jason had lived his life to the fullest, always seeking out new challenges and adventures. And he resolved to honor Jason's memory by continuing to explore and push his own limits, always with a deep respect for the risks and dangers of the world of adventure. This next story took the sub-aqua community by shock, but as seen many times before, the depths of Dorothy does not discriminate its victims. John Edward Hebbard, aged 53, of Charminster Close, Great Sankey, was a man of adventure. As a father of two, John had a deep sense of responsibility towards his family, always making sure to be as safe as possible, but he never let that stop him from pursuing his passions. John had completed over a thousand dives in his lifetime and was a former member of the Warrington Sub-Aqua Club. He had explored some of the most beautiful and challenging dive sites around the world, and he had always done so with a sense of joy and wonder. But earlier this year, tragedy struck. John was involved in a motorcycle accident that left him with several broken bones and a long road to recovery. The accident was a wake-up call for John. And as he recovered from his injuries, John started to reflect on his life and his priorities. He started spending more time with his wife and children, but he could never get rid of that severe itch for adventure. He knew that he needed to find a way to balance his passions with his responsibilities, and he started to plan for his next dive. John dove two years ago in the Southern Red Sea as part of a group of 16. It had been an unforgettable experience for him, and wanting to relive that experience, John had a second expedition planned to the Red Sea in January, and he was determined to be ready for it. Fully aware of the dangers that lurked in the Red Sea, including strong currents and hazardous conditions, John, being a meticulous and cautious diver, recognized the importance of being in top form before exploring its depths. With this in mind, he opted to train at the Dorothy Quarry, honing his skills and preparing himself for the upcoming dive. On December the 20th, 2003, John and his buddy diver arrived at Dorothy Quarry. As it was winter, the waters were exceptionally cold, posing a challenge for even the most experienced divers. Given John's recent motorcycle accident, coping with the frigid temperatures would be an additional hurdle for him to overcome. Nevertheless, they donned their wet suits and gear and descended into the icy waters, determined to explore the old quarry workings and practice for his upcoming dive. The cold water proved to be an immediate shock to John's body, and he struggled to maintain his buoyancy as they swam deeper into the quarry. Regardless of the warning signs, they continued on and finally reached the car stack located deep in the west side of the quarry. Now satisfied, the pair signaled to each other and began their ascent back to the surface. And as the water was extremely cold, they knew it would be best to exit the quarry immediately as they had been diving for around 45 minutes at this point. As they began swimming up, John's buddy diver noticed that he was struggling. The freezing water had made his movement sluggish and difficult to read. Unbeknownst to his buddy diver, John had suffered a heart attack due to the extreme cold of the water. He gripped his chest with extreme panic in his eyes. Unfortunately for John, the heart attack occurred in the worst possible place, 40 meters or 131 feet from the surface in the deep, dark and cold depths of Dorothy, causing him to rapidly lose consciousness from the shock. Despite his buddy diver's valiant efforts to bring him to the surface, John's lifeless body proved too heavy to lift alone. In a desperate attempt to save John, his buddy diver watched in horror as John slowly sank back into the depths of Dorothy, disappearing from sight. Left with no other options, his buddy diver quickly swam to the surface to initiate rescue operations. 
The frigid winter waters hit him with brutal force, but he battled through the pain, driven by the urgent need to save his friend. He called for help just after 1.15 in the afternoon, and within minutes, a team of divers arrived on the scene. The response for their swift response was that the rescue operations were already on standby due to the high number of recent deaths that had occurred at the quarry in the past year. Due to the prompt response of the rescue divers, they were able to reach John just in time before he sunk to the deep. The North Wales police divers frantically brought John's lifeless body to the surface, still holding on to the small glimmer of hope that he could still be alive. The rescue team promptly put John in the air ambulance and rushed him to Isbitty Gwynedd Hospital. But, despite their best efforts, John was pronounced dead on arrival. To compound the tragedy, the buddy diver suffered from the bends, a painful and potentially fatal condition caused by his rapid ascent to the surface. He was promptly airlifted to a specialist decompression chamber on the Wirral for urgent treatment, and thankfully, he managed to survive. Once again, as seen many times in cave diving, tragedy can strike at any time for those who dare to venture into the depths of the underwater world. Dorothy Quarry remains as a sober reminder of the risks involved in such endeavours. It highlights that even the most experienced and skilled divers can fall victim to the hazards of the deep, and that safety should always be the top priority when embarking on such adventures. May Paula, Jason and John Rest in peace. Nearly a decade ago, a very fatal tragedy occurred in a secluded deep blue hue river in Mindanao, Philippines. The Hinechuan Enchanted River is a flawless deep saltwater spring that flows into the Pacific Ocean. It is around 24 meters or 80 feet deep and is just barely long enough to be considered a river. Yet, the flow attracts visitors from around the world who want to experience the beautiful waters that locals have long thought to be miraculous. Underneath the entrancing blue waters lurks a cave system that plunges to great depths, contributing to the river's enchanting and mystical allure. Truly an exquisite and enigmatic location, boasting with unparalleled levels of charm that justifies its name as the enchanted river of Hanachuan. Dr. Alfonso Amores was extremely captivated by the river's beauty and mystique, leading him to embark on five expeditions to the site since 2010. During his explorations, he extended the cave system below to a depth of 87 meters, or 285 feet, driven by his fascination with the enchanted river. However, during his sixth visit in 2014, tragedy struck, and he unknowingly took his final dive leaving behind a legacy of passion and curiosity. This is the enchanted river of nature and disaster of 2014. The Hinatuan Enchanted River, also called the Hinatuan Sacred River, is a deep spring river on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. It flows into the Philippine Sea and the Pacific Ocean at Bangray Talisi, Hinatuan, Serigao del Sur. It is found between the boundaries of barangays of Telese and Camatong. It earned the moniker Enchanted River from the diplomat Modisto Forlan, who described the river in his poem entitled Rio Encantado. Hanachuan Bay, which is the habitat of various species of turtles, is located at its mouth. Its mouth also offers a safe anchorage against storms and typhoons. The river's unusual colors and unexplored depths have inspired various local legends. One story tells of fairies that added the color of sapphire and jade to the river to make its unique shade. Local fisher folk also report seeing fish in the river that cannot be caught through any means. According to locals, the river was called the Enchanted River because of the Engantos that dwell there, which in Filipino culture are mythical environmental spirits that are said to have the ability to appear in human form. Their legends also say that the river is haunted by supernatural beings, which act as its protectors. Since 2017, the local government of Hanachuan has prohibited tourists from swimming in the main pool due to preservation and maintenance. However, they have designated a swimming area for tourists near the center of the lagoon, 
which is 10 meters or 33 feet away from the main pool. The first discovery and exploration to the cave of the Hanesuan Enchanted River was made by Alex Santos in 1999. The major exploration to the cave system started 11 years later, when a group of three cave divers, led by Dr. Alfonso Amors, with team members Benil Gastardo and Emiji Gillimore, entered the cave in February 2010. The major exploration led to the discovery of a hidden cave opening at 30 meters or 98 feet depth. Succeeding expeditions with Dr. Amores led to the discovery of the underwater cave's chamber, referred to as Mare's Chamber. During the sixth expedition of the cave history on June the 17th, 2014, is when the fatal tragedy of Dr. Amores occurred. Dr. Alfonso Amores, known in the island as Doc Boy, was brought up in the Old Upon a Publican on Macton Island, where he was born and raised. He grew up in a large family of 34 individuals and was surrounded by the quintessential Publican neighborhood, which played a significant role in shaping his character and values. He always had a passion for medicine, ever since he was a child growing up on Macton Island in the Philippines. He was fascinated by the human body and the intricate workings of its systems, and he knew from a young age that he wanted to pursue a career in medicine. After completing his undergraduate studies, Dr. Amores enrolled in the Cebu Institute of Medicine, where he earned his medical degree in 1971. He then set his sights on furthering his education and honing his skills in the field of plastic surgery, so he packed his bags and headed to the United States. With his extensive education and training complete, Dr. Amores set out to put his skills to use. He practiced plastic surgery in the US for nearly two decades, from 1982 to the year 2000. Despite his success in the US, Dr. Amores never forgot his roots in the Philippines. He remained connected to his homeland and often returned to visit family and friends on Macton Island. He also provided charitable medical services to those in need in the Philippines, using his expertise to improve the lives of others. After practicing surgery for 20 years in the United States, Dr. Amores decided to return to his home country, the Philippines, to enjoy his retirement. But he was not the kind of man who would be happy to whittle away his years in a rocking chair while watching the seasons pass. He instead chose to do cave diving explorations. Unable to get satisfaction from breathing air or gas from a standard scuba setup, he embarked to get educated in the use of a closed circuit rebreather. His weapon of choice was the Evolution Closed Circuit Rebreather, which he trained up to try mix level, and of which he qualified as an IANTD Evolution Recreational Instructor. He did his cave diving certification through the National Association of Cave Divers in the extensive cave systems of northern Florida. His discovery of the powered underwater cave system in Magdana Island during solo exploration dives in 2002 marked the birth of the cave diving culture in the central Philippines. Cave diving was not as popular as scuba diving in the Philippines until Dr. Amores started the Filipino Divers Association. In 2011, he made a dive with his unit to 100 meters or 330 feet. Quite a feat considering he was already 65 years old at that time. His efforts to go beyond certain barriers, such as age, made people truly believe that he could do anything. He lived his life to the fullest, embracing challenges and pushing boundaries, all while making a difference in the world. Therefore, when the news of his unforeseen tragedy circulated around the island of Mactan and those who knew him, it was seen as a devastating void that could never be filled. On June the 17th, 2014, Doc Morris and two of his cave diving students one of which was named Jamie Lepak, arrived at the Enchanted River site. The purpose of the dive was to set up safety measures and a guideline for a wildlife film documentary crew, eager to capture footage of the river's mystical beauty. It should be noted that Doc, now 68 years old, was diagnosed with his heart ailment at the age of 40, but this did not stop him from cave diving. In addition, he was also admitted for pneumonia a few weeks before this dive. As mentioned prior, Dr. Amores was not the first to discover the cave system, 
but he was the first to discover the deeper chambers of the cave. In his previous exploration dives of this cave, Doc discovered a very tight passageway that led to a bigger chamber and a few more passageways. The passage was subsequently named Doc's Door. After completing their equipment checks, Doc and his fellow student divers prepared to descend into the depths of the Enchanted River. Diving in the Enchanted River is always a daunting challenge, and it is viewed as a great accomplishment for any diver who emerges unscathed. The cave entrance is narrow, allowing only one person to enter at a time. However, the current guided the team effortlessly inside. The same current that assisted them in entering the cave also made exiting very challenging, as the water tends to pull divers back towards the cave. If the current is not too strong, divers may be fortunate enough to make it out with ease. With this in mind, and the risks acknowledged, with Doc leading the way, the team began their descent into the cave system during low tide. The team descended 30 meters, or 98 feet, diving to the bottom of the pool. At this point, a large log can be seen that marks the split into a right and left lane to get to Dog's door and the entry point to Mare's chamber. Although the left lane, called Patrice's Way, located at 32 meters or 102 feet is an easier access point because it hugs a cavity on the left wall, which usually lessens the current flow, the team decided to enter Mare's chamber, laying line in the right lane, called Bernil's Crawl also located at 32 meters or 105 feet, which is a crawling descent to Dog's door. As the team pushed forward, they attempted to enter through Burnell's crawl, but they encountered a significant deposit of sediment in the fissure, causing the current to flow faster than they could handle. Consequently, they switched to Patrice's way to reach Dog's door. Unfortunately, the current in Patrice's way was even stronger and it proved to be even more challenging to enter. The primary reason for this difficulty was the fact that the team made their dive during the descending low tide. The low tide made the current flow of the cave's fresh water stronger due to the absence of an opposing force of the flooding seawater. In addition, while Patrice's way is still wide enough for divers to enter the cave, the pileup of sediment in Bernil's crawl eventually diverted the water flow into Patrice's way thus making it harder to overcome the outgoing flow. The team discovered that they needed to exercise extreme caution in response to the swift and forceful current, both entering and exiting the cave system. They were exerting too much effort and breathing more air than usual just to try to push into the cave. Despite the strong currents, it's unclear why Doc didn't decide to call off the dive at this point. In spite of the challenging conditions, Doc was determined to press on with the dive due to the upcoming documentary shoot for GMA 7 Born to be Wild, which had enlisted the team's expertise, and Doc didn't want to disappoint the film crew. With this in mind, the team soldiered on and eventually made their way through Patrice's way to reach Mare's chamber, taking care to lay line for the shoot the following day. This chamber was previously measured by Doc's team to be 37 meters or 121 feet long, and 31 meters, or 101 feet wide, with a max height of 8 meters, or 26 feet. This time, more sedimentation on the bed made the bottom closer to the ceiling. There were several fish swimming with the team inside the chamber. The team continued their dive in the cave system and reached Kelvin's kneecap at a depth of 52 meters, or 171 feet. They then proceeded to Paul's Passage and continued diving until they reached a depth of around 87 meters or 285 feet, at which point they decided to end the dive. Two factors influenced this decision. Firstly, the team wasted a substantial amount of time and air trying to pass Patrice's way, and they had to follow the rule of thirds, which meant ensuring that they had enough air to make it back to the surface. Secondly, they had already reached the limit of their planned exploration, and the film crew had no intention of venturing into the unexplored sections for the shoot the following day. Therefore, there was no potential profit to justify risking their lives in such a perilous situation, and they turned the dive. Unbeknownst to Doc and the team, 
a deadly siphon in Mayor's chamber awaited them, which would mean they would need two-thirds and some extra to be able to exit the cave comfortably, a situation they were neither aware nor prepared to handle. Siphon comes from the French siphon, or Spanish siphon. It is a passage where the water reaches the roof, so there is no air movement between one side and the other. In general, these passages are considered to be more dangerous because of strong flow of the current. Upon their return to Mare's chamber, the team prepared to exit the cave by navigating a narrow passage through Doc's door. However, Jamie Lepac, one of the student divers, was taken aback when Doc changed the exit order, instructing the two cave diving students to proceed ahead of him. They were surprised, but could not argue because he was directing them. But Jamie noticed something irregular about Doc because he wasn't moving his feet. He did not respond when he made a hand, OK. Instead, he replied with his right arm up, signaling them to go ahead of him. While making their way towards the exit of Mayor's chamber and approaching Doc's door, the team became trapped in a treacherous siphon, which was life-threatening to the team. Given that Doc was the last in line, the current proved to be extremely strenuous on his body and heart, putting him in greater danger. Despite being young and inexperienced, the students managed to summon enough strength to navigate through the strong current that was flowing through Doc's door. However, Doc struggled tremendously and was unable to pass the tight passageway through the current as it kept pulling him back into Mayor's chamber, despite his multiple attempts. In fact, he grew weaker and more fatigued as he continued to push through the powerful current. Jamie noticed his mentor struggling and attempted to rescue him. However, Jamie's efforts were hindered by the fact that he was also running out of air due to swimming against the powerful current. When swimming against the current in cave diving, divers use more air compared to when swimming with the current, or when there is no current at all. This is because the resistance of the water flowing against the diver requires more effort and energy to swim, and as a result, the diver breathes more rapidly and consumes more air. As a result, the air supply of all team members was rapidly depleting and reaching critical levels, adding to the urgency of their escape from the cave. In cave diving, the primary rule is to prioritize your own safety first. Therefore, despite feeling helpless, the students were left with no option but to surface, leaving Doc trapped in the unforgiving currents of the siphon. The students continued their journey towards the exit, traversing through Doc's door and Patrice's way all whilst fighting the strong current. After his students departed, Doc knew he was in a very dire situation and the probability of him surviving now was ever so slight. In a last ditch effort to stay anchored, he tied one of his hands to the line to prevent the strong current from sweeping him away. Despite his dwindling oxygen levels and a resolve not to give up, Doc summoned his last ounce of strength and kicked his legs with all his might and tried to squeeze through the tight opening that was Doc's door. However, he was not getting enough air to compensate for his strenuous activity, and in a sudden turn of events, he suffered a heart attack due to the tension on his already weakened heart. At this point, Doc's chances of exiting the cave alive were next to impossible, and it would take a miracle for him to survive. He was trapped in a treacherous siphon struggling to survive as his oxygen levels dwindled and his heart gave out. After a total dive time of 1 hour and 15 minutes, the students completely drained, finally surfaced and immediately contacted the authorities, informing them of their mentor's dire situation. As they were aware of Doc's dwindling air supply, they knew that time was of the essence. Doc's brother, Lapu Lapu, City Vice Mayor Maro Amores, promptly travelled to Saragal del Sor upon receiving reports of the incident. When rescue divers arrived on the scene and assessed the situation, they realised that attempting to enter the cave system would prove fatal to their exit due to the powerful current. After inferring the tragic outcome, they made the heartbreaking decision to hold the rescue as they knew that Doc would no longer be alive. The recovery operation would now become a body recovery. Jake Miranda, a cave diver from Cerigo City, led the eight-hour retrieval of Dog's body, which was found 40 metres deep, submerged in Mayor's chamber. 
The autopsy reports conducted by the investigators in Sarajevo City confirmed that Doc died from a heart attack. The tragic incident caused the Enchanted River management to temporarily close the area. Doc's body was brought back to Cebu and laid to rest on Wednesday at the Mactan Memorial Gardens after a 10 a.m. mass at Our Lady of Sacred Heart Parish in Barangay Marigondon, Lapu Lapu City. He is survived by his wife, Luz, a son and two daughters. It is a heartbreaking tragedy that once again highlights the dangers of cave diving. While these brave divers know the risks involved, it doesn't make it any less devastating when something like this happens. Doc Amore has dedicated his life to exploring the mysteries of the underwater world, but unfortunately, his passion ultimately led to his untimely death. It is a reminder of just how fragile life can be and how quickly things can go wrong, even for the most experienced divers. Doc's family and loved ones are left to mourn his passing, and the diving community has lost a true pioneer. May he rest in peace. Welcome to Wookie Hole, a small village nestled in the beautiful Mendib Hills, just outside the historic city of Wales. With a population of just 450, this tranquil village seems like an idyllic escape from the hustle and bustle of modern life. But there's more to Wookie Hole than meets the eye. This is the Wookie Hole disaster of 1981. Sandwiched between the Somerset levels and the Mendibs, Wookie Hole Village offers lovely places to explore. In high summer, Wookie Hole Village is thronged with visitors, all seeking entrance to the show caves. Not to mention the glorious mix of scenery, with the hills having woodland and reservoirs where you can find habitats for wildlife. Have you ever felt the magnetic pull of a place that seems to have a personality all of its own? That's exactly how Keith Potter, a fellow OUCC diver, felt when he first discovered the small and secluded town. To Keith, there was something about this town that set it apart from all the others. Perhaps it's the way the sunlight filters through the trees, casting a warm and inviting glow over everything. Or maybe it's the way the river that flows through the heart of the town glistens and sparkles in the sunlight, tempting you to take a refreshing dip. But as mentioned before, there's more to this town than just its picturesque scenery. For Keith, the real allure lay beneath the surface. As an experienced cave diver, he was drawn to the hidden depths of the nearby caves and underground rivers, eager to explore their mysteries and secrets. And as we follow in Keith's footsteps, we too begin to uncover the hidden wonders of this town that he was so mesmerized by. From the dry, massive caverns to the beautiful submerged sections, Keith knew this town was a true gem waiting to be discovered. Young, charming, and smart are all words used to describe Keith Potter. On paper, he seemed to have a one-way ticket to a successful life filled with dreams and aspirations. Being only 22 years old, he was a man of many talents outside of caving. His scholarship in medicine at Exeter College, Oxford, was surely the first step towards realizing his ambition to become a consultant physician. To those in the Oxford University Cave Club and others who knew him, his limitless enthusiasm not only for life, but for expeditions, be they to Mendip, Yorkshire or Spain was unmatched. Keith's contribution to caving, especially in the OUCC, was enormous. During the 1980 expedition to Poza del Xitu, he took part in many pushing trips, offering his companions encouragement and showing determination to continue where others were prepared to turn back. Even in the most difficult circumstances, he retained his humor while remaining absolutely reliable. Most notably in 1981, after emerging from a 35-hour pushing trip into severe passages in which he sustained a knee injury and suffered agonizing friction sores in his groin, Keith was the first to reach G2's terminal sump. Despite being injured, tired and thoroughly wet, he showed his determined character by spending hours searching for a bypass. Without Keith, the Oxford University Cave Club might still be trying to bottom their G2 cave. 
Keith never took unnecessary risks. Indeed, his thoroughness and caution in unexplored passages could frustrate those less experienced team members, carried away with exploration fever. But that is exactly what made him an excellent cave diver. Which brings us to the Wookiee Hole Cave. Keith still had one more year to go before finishing the pre-clinical part of his medical training and decided what better way to unwind from the pressure and stresses of medical school by taking a respite trip to Wookiee Hole on November the 15th, 1981, a trip he had made before. Cave diving was in its infancy during the 1930s. In the beginning, explorers did not look at cave diving as a form of sport or a diving method. Rather, it was more of a means to reach a specific end while dry caving. Particularly in the United Kingdom, dry caving dates back hundreds of years. Yet, the water-filled sections of many caves kept explorers from making progress. In the case of the Wookiee Hole Caves, the original dive crew's goal was simply to get through the cave, bypass the water, and reach the next dry section. Thus, cave diving was born as a technique used to further cave expeditions, and has since transformed into both an activity and exploration tool in its own right. The first divers to take the plunge in Wookiee Hole on the 14th of July 1935 were Graham Balcom and Penelope Powell, who was affectionately known as Mossy. It is worth noting that Powell was the only female diver on the team, and today is considered one of cave diving's unsung pioneers. If you do some further research on her, you can read her story and learn of her tremendous contributions. Unfortunately, she has been left out of several surface level records, including the Wookiee Hole Caves Wikipedia page, which states that fellow crew member Jack Shepard, not Powell, made the first dive with Balcom. Powell and Balcom's first dive had them wearing the standard diving equipment at the time, which included brass helmets, chest plates, canvas suits, and lead boots. They had to walk on their hands and knees along the cave floor in near zero visibility, dragging their breathing hoses and lifelines behind them as the unsettled silt flew all around them. Luckily, the details about the equipment they wore was well documented, and we have a fair understanding of what their dives likely looked like. It is interesting to note that the suits worn back then were made for male navy divers, and Powell's did not fit her as it should. To fix the problem, tape was used in various places to ensure her suit was properly sealed. With the goal of further exploring the Wookiee Hole Caves in mind, the divers set up a base in the third chamber, and eventually made their way past the previously discovered fourth chamber to the fifth, sixth, and seventh chambers. They were unable to go any farther, as their base-fed airlines and weighted equipment restricted them from travelling more than 61 metres or 200 feet. Cave diving originated that midsummer day with Powell and Balcom. Since then, thousands of tourists and very few divers have travelled to Wookiee Hole in hopes of discovering more than their predecessors and pushing the boundaries of technical cave diving. One such diver was Keith Potter. Today, Wookiee Hall is explored to Chamber 25, called the Lake of Gloom. Until this point, the cave is almost horizontal, going up and down, so the cave is partly water-filled and partly air-filled. But at the end of this chamber, the character of the cave changes. It starts to steadily go down. The sump is closed by gravel chokes after about 400 metres or 1,315 feet and 90 metres or 290 feet below water level. This is the deepest point of the cave, and as the water level of the cave river is around 64 metres, or 210 feet, this spot is about 26 metres, or 85 feet below sea level. Keith Potter and fellow OUCC members arrived at Wookiee Hole on November the 14th, 1981, hoping to push the boundaries of this undiscovered cave. The team parked their vehicles and began the trek to the cave. The parking lot is located at one end of the village, so in order to reach the cave, it must be crossed by foot, which is about a 10 minute walk. The first part of the village is full of shops, kiosks, and fish and chips. 
Then, at the paper mill, the Wookie Hole theme park starts. The cave tour is only one of numerous features of this theme park. The cave is on the southern escarpment of the Mendib Hills and is the resurgence that drains the southern flanks of North Hill and Penn Hill. It is the second largest resurgence on Mendib, with an estimated catchment area of 46.2 square kilometers, or 17.8 square miles, and an average discharge of 789 liters, or 208 US gallons per second. The caves have been used by humans for around 45,000 years, demonstrated by the discovery of tools from the Paleolithic period, along with fossilized animal remains. Wookie Hole lays in the same limestone ridge as the famous Gorge Cave, only a few kilometers to the south. The limestone is covered by a layer of dolomitic breccia, which is less prone to solution. There are fewer cracks and the chemistry of dolomite is different to limestone, which makes it a little less soluble. This difference explains many details of the cave formation. With morals high, Keith and the OUCC begin the penetration of the cave. The entrance to the Wookiee Hole Cave is on the right side of the valley, which means it is at the end of a gorge cut into the limestone by the River Axe. As the team step into this natural wonder through Chamber 1, they were immediately mesmerized by the River Axe that gracefully flows through the cave, creating a stunning and unique landscape that left them awestruck. The Wookiee Hole Caves are not only a feast for the eyes, but also a site of special scientific interest SSSI, for both biological and geological reasons, due to the Breccia limestone. The river axe is formed by the water entering the cave system and flows through the third and first chambers. From chamber one, it flows to the resurgence, through two sumps, the first being 40 meters or 130 feet, and the second being 30 meters or 98 feet long, where it leaves the cave and enters the open air. The river is maintained at an artificially high level and falls a couple of meters when a sluice is lowered to allow access to the ninth chamber and beyond. It should be noted that the first part of the cave, as far as the third chamber, is open to tourists and lit by permanent electric lighting. But beyond that, it is accessible only to cave divers, who, as I mentioned, have still not probed all its secrets. The first and second chambers pose no difficulty for Keith and the OUCC, and they navigated through them with ease. Upon reaching the third chamber, the team set up camp, following in the footsteps of many previous explorers who had rested there before. Chamber three, or Witch's Parlor, is famous for its size. A huge solution dome dissolved by the groundwater when the water level was much higher in the past. After setting up camp in the third chamber, the team prepared their diving equipment and went over the plan to ensure that everyone was up to date on the purpose of the exploration, which was to explore the deepest recesses of the cave, located in Chamber 25. In addition to diving as far as possible, the team also planned to map new undiscovered sections of the cave. Unbeknownst to the group, Keith had ulterior motives for the dive. With all checks in place, the group continued deeper into the cave, equipped with their diving gear for the sumps further down. The subsequent chambers presented a stark contrast to chambers one and two. From here on out, the chambers were characterized by low and narrow clefts. Starting from chamber three, tight tunnels connected the subsequent chambers to each other. The total length of passages in this area was about 820 meters or 2,690 feet. The group navigated through the twisting tunnels, maneuvering past the narrow squeezes of chambers four, five, six, seven, and eight, until they arrived at chamber nine, also known as the cathedral. The sense of anticipation and curiosity about what lies ahead is a feeling that most cavers experience, and Keith was no exception. Today though, he was driven by an especially strong urge to venture further than ever before into Wookiee Hole, eager to uncover new mysteries in its depths. This may be due to the fact that Keith had heard rumors of a hidden underground river system that flowed deep beneath the caverns of Wookiee Hole. Unaware of the exact location, 
He spent countless hours studying maps and reading about the geological formations that lay beneath the surface, and he was convinced that he was on the brink of a groundbreaking discovery. After regrouping in Chamber 9, without waiting on the group, overcome with a youthful bliss, Keith inserted his mouthpiece and proceeded to attempt the sump dive between the 9th and 19th chambers, a long 200-foot, but now well-traversed route, which he had successfully navigated before, but never gone beyond, which he was determined to change. There are two routes through the sump, and Keith set off first through the lower, deeper passage, leaving Martin Farr, one of the best cave divers in the country, to follow along the shallower route. Overcome with excitement of the unknown, and emboldened by his previous experience diving the sump, Keith threw all caution to the wind, ready to navigate the passage with an intense surge of adrenaline coursing through his body. As he hurried and viciously pumped his legs through the passage, the speed of his movements made him increasingly lightheaded, whilst drastically increasing his heart rate. Suddenly, his vision was engulfed in total darkness, as if a switch had been flipped. As Keith pushed deeper into the sump of the cave system, his sense of excitement began to give way to fear and uncertainty. He swam uphill from the elbow of the sump, which was 70 feet deep. The water grew colder and the current stronger, making it increasingly difficult for him to swim. As a result, he couldn't breathe in enough air to sustain the strenuous exertion on his body. His lungs burned for air, but he refused to turn back, convinced that he was so very close to the end of the sump a wishful way of thinking that was attributed to the disorientation he was experiencing. Despite his growing desperation, Keith continued to press on until he could no longer ignore the warning signs of his body. He was beginning to shut down. His vision began to blur beyond a point of no return, and his muscles grew weak. Rather than taking a break, he made the ill-fated decision to push on. He was determined to make it to the end of the sump, reaching airspace in the 19th chamber and continuing his exploring until he found the underground river. In the end, Keith gave it all he got until there was nothing left to give. His determination proved to be his downfall. His lungs were completely depleted of air, causing him to essentially suffocate to death. When Far finally reached the end of the sump, he discovered Keith laying in 10 feet of water motionless and with his air tank mouthpiece floating free. Keith was in plain sight of airspace at the very end of the flooded section. Far immediately dove to retrieve him and other members of the group soon joined in the rescue effort. They desperately attempted artificial respiration for nearly an hour but unfortunately it was too late and Keith had already passed away. In a panic the group rushed out the cave system exiting the left side of the valley close to the spring of the river axe below a steep limestone cliff face. The way back is following a tree-lined canal path, a trail along the paper mill canal, which was built in 1857. Alas, after reaching their vehicles, they called for help and the body recovery for 22 Keith Porter began. Dave, I'm afraid I've got bad news. Keith's dead. His funeral was located in Wedmore, not five miles from where he died. To those in the Oxford University Cave Club and others who knew him, his death remains almost incomprehensible. Not even his funeral, held near his parents' home at Wedmore, really brought home the fact that the Oxford University Cave Club would never see him bounding into the bar during a midweek club meeting or share his limitless enthusiasm for future trips. Although the OUCC had all agreed to erect a memorial in honour of Keith, they felt a little uneasy about doing so because they remembered how Keith himself had been dismissive of a similar plaque commemorating a caver in Black Shiver Pot, Yorkshire. Keith had once said that the caves were permanent while cavers were transitory. Despite their reservations, the group ultimately decided to place the memorial at the bottom of Jitu's steep entrance climb where it would be visible to future cavers. The plaque was crafted from stainless steel and bore the following inscription. Pozel del Gitu, 1,139 meters, 
Keith Potter, who died diving, in Wookiee Hole, 141181, the first man to bottom this cave. Once again, we are confronted with a tragic story that showcases the perils of cave diving. Despite awareness of the unforeseen dangers that can arise when exploring these underwater mazes, accidents can still occur with devastating consequences. Keith's untimely passing is a loss felt by all who knew him. He was a shining light in a dark world. May he rest in peace. This has been Gribbing Horror. I hope to see you in the next one.